Uh, big Salbona and good evening to all of you joining us for this virtual book launch of the Roberts Birds of President Natal and their Zulu bird names. We are extremely excited to be able to co-host this virtual launch with Jakarta Media and the Johan Fulko Bird Book Fund, um, who are the sort of housing body of the Roberts Bird Books. And we are very, very excited to also have Chair of BirdLife Port Natal, Nicolette Forbes, joining us this evening. She's going to be doing a quick shout out for the amazing conservation work that the club has been supporting in line with this amazing book. So um, thank you all for joining us this evening. And uh, I'm going to quickly hand over to Nikki just to introduce the amazing BirdLife Port Natal calendar. So Nikki, over to you. Hi, Melissa. Thank you very, very much for giving us this opportunity. And I hope we provide a really wonderful introduction to this exciting launch because we've got a lovely synergy that has happened this year with our calendar. As you know, I'm just going to hold it up here and I think you're going to play the video so that people see a bit more detail just now. But we've been running this calendar with the club since 2008 and it always has a theme. Uh, last year's theme was about celebrating KZN's birds and their discovery, the, all the birds that were discovered to science for the first time. Um, and were described in KZN for the first time. So that was this year's 2020 calendar. And we decided that it was very, it was very important to start profiling the cultural side of our birds and the indigenous knowledge that exists within the province. And so we had a theme that is celebrating and understanding the Zulu names of our KwaZulu Natal birds for 2021. And all of us are looking forward to 2021 and leaving 2020 behind us. So it's, it's fantastic to have a theme that talks so nicely what, to what you are all going to be speaking to tonight. Um, as you know, we, are, we take the proceeds from the calendar and most of it goes back into conservation. And Melissa, you know this very well yourself from our calendar this year because we've managed to donate to the Southern Bandit Snake Eagle Project already and with the proceeds from this year's calendar, we hope to actually double that contribution. So it's something that we really look forward to participating in as well going forward, the Southern Bandit Snake Eagle Project. But we've also contributed more widely to the Mouse Free Marion Project. We've managed to take something like just over 40,000 Rand in funds um, and spread it around to some of those things. Bird Lasso I managed to get some of that this year to help with the, the running of that Bird Lasso and then the COVID-19 relief fund for the guards. So it, it's really lovely for the club and the members to be able to give back to birds and bird conservation. I don't know if there's anything else you would particularly like to know. I suppose that is the most important aspect. This year, we managed to profile the club in the first page as well as the book. So that has been really nice and that we can use it as, as partly outreach to get the message around the world, really, because many of them go that go overseas, they go overseas as gifts. And as your advert is on the screen, people can see what the cost is. It's a very reasonable cost for a stocking filler, for a Christmas present, and a really, really nice gift because they are wonderful glossy productions with beautiful birds in them. And Hugh Chittenden does the photographs and we're very grateful to him for donating those photographs. And he has also, I think, been involved in the book and um, some of his photographs. So. There's lovely synergy between the two, but I'll let you carry that away. Definitely. And, and as always, from our side, thanks, Nikki, for the support that BirdLife Port Natal does show to both BirdLife South Africa and our guides. Um, it's wonderful to collaborate with you guys. So I'm going to play the video clip now and uh, everyone will thanks see a little bit more about this amazing calendar. Thanks so much yeah, for joining can us. I, can I just say thanks very much for allowing us to do this and to the panel of authors there. Congratulations, it's absolutely fantastic and it's so exciting and I can't wait to watch the rest of it. For sure, thanks Nikki. Okay. Okay.
is the calendar. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thanks, and, Melissa. Uh, Thanks very oh, much. Yes. If I could just say the insert, which did get profiled in the video, actually profiles all our community guides, some of whom are here on the panel tonight. So it's an added extra, which ad really adds value to the calendar purchase. And the orders can come to calendars at blpn.org. And that's it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nikki. And uh, it is a great pleasure to be able to now introduce our esteemed panelists that are joining us this evening. Um, in no particular order, we've got Professor Nolene Turner, Sakamuzi Mflongo, Tembe Mtembu, and Spamandla Junior Gabela. Now, Professor Nolene Turner spent 32 years teaching Zulu at the universities of Durban Westville and KwaZulu Natal. In retirement, she continues to be active in the field as an honorary research professor at UKZN, still presenting and authoring academic papers and books. She's aptly nicknamed Kanyisile, which in Zulu means lighting the way. Turner continues to be a thought leader in the field of Zulu language and culture. And Professor Turner is also a keen birder. And in 2003, after her involvement in the translation into Zulu of our beginner's guide to birds, she realized that there were huge gaps in the names that Zulu people had for the birds of KwaZulu Natal. As a result, she initiated a unique conversation and linguistics project together with Professor Adrian Kirkman and Roger Porter that resulted in the creation of a first of its kind book, The Birds of KwaZulu Natal and Their Zulu Names. Turner's published 45 accredited articles in local and overseas journals, and she is well recognized in her field, both locally and internationally, having presented papers at international conferences in over 15 different countries. It's wonderful to have you with us, Nolene. I don't know if you want to just say hello to everyone. And Monani, hello everybody. There we go, thanks Nolene. Um, next up, we've got Sakamuzi Mflongo, and he is quoted as saying, I live and breathe birding, it's my passion. Sakamuzi's love for birding began as a child in the grasslands of his home village, which is appropriately called Inyoni, which actually means bird in Isizulu, and this is a village near Amatikulu on the north coast of KwaZulu Natal. After deciding that he wanted to work with birds, he trained as a bird guide in 2000 in Vakastrum and has been an accredited BirdLife South Africa guide since 2005. Sakamuzi is a passionate and extremely knowledgeable bird guide who is often contracted by birding tour companies to lead parties of bird watchers intent on finding those specials that we find in KwaZulu Natal. He's actively involved in environmental education, and over the past decade, he's helped with youth education programs through the Wildlife and Environmental Society of South Africa, also known as WESA. And he also works with the Department of Education to conduct weekly environmental mentoring, sorry, weekly environmental education classes in Ashawi. And this is where he teaches children about forest ecology. He's also a mentor to potential future bird guides amongst the youth. And Sakamuzi has been a stalwart that everyone looks up to at the workshops from 2013 to 2018. And he's been one of the leading contributors to this process, helping to revise and adapt and extend the list of Zulu bird names. He was awarded one of BirdLife South Africa's Owl Awards in 2017, and that is for his contribution to giving conservation wings. Nice to have you with us, Sakamuzi. Do you want to say hello to everyone? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> then we've got Tembo Mtembu. Now, Mr. Tembo Mtembu was born and grew up in northern KwaZulu Natal in the area known as the Elephant Coast. As a youth, he herded cattle on the Nibela Peninsula next to the Isimangaliso Wetlands Park World Heritage Site. In the area, his uncle is the tribal chief, and he has in depth local knowledge of the Zulu people, their culture, customs, and history, as well as the local wildlife and birds. He pursued a career in conservation once he left school and also became an accredited bird guide with BirdLife South Africa in 2001. Between 2002 to 2004, he worked at Ndumo Game Reserve as an environmental educator for the local schools. And from 2006 to 2007, he upgraded his guiding qualifications to an NQF4, which is the highest level, and is now training as a guide in whitewater canoeing as well. A very talented man there, Timber. In 2008, Timber established his own company, Timber's Birding and Eco Tours. And in the same year, he was also accredited as an ambassador for education, training, developing practices, sector education and training authority. And he was contracted by the Tourism World Academy for tourist guide training. 
And since 2010, Timber has been training local bird guides at the Timber Elephant Park, as well as training guides for the Tourism World Academy. This work was recognized in 2015 when he was the recipient of the National Best Tourist Guide of the Year Award, a dedicated premier tourism award. Over the past 18 years, Timber's dedicated his life to improving the lives of his community and promoting biodiversity and conservation. And to this end, he often helps organize local school meetings to discuss critical environmental issues, including protecting wildlife from poachers and the impact that alien plant species have on our biodiversity. He's currently working on the Birding for Sustainable Living project, where he has convinced five local homesteads to turn their back gardens into bird-friendly areas. In this way, he's helping to promote and improve the livelihoods of people in local communities, while at the same time encouraging them to support tourism and conservation efforts. Mr. Ntembu played a highly constructive role in this project with his creativity and thought of ideas at all of the workshops that were held. Thanks for joining us, Ntembu. Do you wanna to agree to everybody? Hi, right, Sanbonani. Very pleased to meet you all. Thanks so much, Timber. And last but definitely not least, Mr. Junior Gabella. He, is, he grew up on the banks of the Amatkulu estuary in KwaZulu-Natal, and his infectious enthusiasm, pleasant and friendly nature, his wealth of knowledge and drive to share his ornithological passion are standout qualities of his business, birding in KwaZulu-Natal with Junior Gabela. And he was inspired by his friend, Sakamuzi Mflongo, who got him, who works closely with Junior, who encouraged him to undergo training as a BirdLife South Africa bird guide in 2000. He got his qualification in 2005 and is currently working towards his Field Guide Association of Southern Africa Level 2 qualifications. Junior's interest in understanding the different habitats in coastal KwaZulu-Natal has naturally grown and he's become an environmental educator for the Wildlife Environmental Society of Southern Africa at their Mtanzini Twin Streams facility. He also assists the Marine and Estuarine Research Program with sampling of aquatic organisms and teaching tertiary level ecological courses. In addition to this, he's also involved in bird surveys and some of those I've had the personal privilege of joining Junior on and he is absolutely an essential member of our research teams as well as doing work with students from universities across South Africa, including those of Pretoria and KwaZulu-Natal. His main love, however, is definitely taking people on bird watching tours, mainly through the KwaZulu-Natal North Coast. In his own words, Educating and cultivating a love for nature and an interest in environmental research and people, especially the youth, is my goal. If the youth grow up with that passion, they will change the future of our environment for the better. I also want to show people the incredible ecotourism potential we have on the North Coast. On the North Coast. He established himself as one of the major contributors to this workshop and he took part from 2015 onwards and has been one of the three main contributors alongside his mentor Sakamuzi and Temba and he was also awarded a BirdLife South Africa Owl Award in 2018 for giving conservation wings. Do you want to agree to everybody, Junior? Zanbonani, <laughs> good evening to you all. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We really are lucky to have such a talented panel with us this evening. Now, we just also need to acknowledge the rest of the team behind this book who are not joining us for this live launch. Um, co-authors Adrian Kupman, Roger Porter, as well as Becky Senzezo, Benson and Gubane. So we just want to acknowledge the contributions that each of these gentlemen have also made to this project. Now moving on to our very first question. This one's going to Nolene, who I see is slightly off screen at the moment. But uh, Nolene, would you like to just give us some background on how the idea for this book originated, please? Good evening, everyone. I uh, just wanted to reinforce what you've just said, and that was to thank my co-authors, um, Adrian Kirkman and Roger Porter, for all their support. This book definitely would not have made it to print if it hadn't been for them. They were the stalwart of the team, and, um, and I'm sorry they can't be with us tonight to add to the discussion. Uh, in, in answer to your question, how did this book originate? Uh, the original work was done to do the translation of this particular book, Ngezi Nyoni Zetu, which is a little um, beginner's guide to birds, which was to be translated into Zulu, which was done in 2003. And one of the things that really amazed me was how many gaps in the knowledge there were. There were loads of gaps in Zulu names. There was a, a name like Ukwazi, which would cover many eagles. Uh, 
and uh, I, I could not find any species specific names. So having done that book and with the, the dearth of knowledge that I had, I decided after to embark on this project. The project was too big for me to do on my own and I struggled along from say 2005 onwards until I decided that the, the only way to make headway with it was to actually have workshops. So the workshops I embarked on started in 2013 and the magnitude of the task was too big for me. So I asked Professor Kirkman, Adrian, a colleague, a long standing colleague and friend of mine, if he would join me, which he very happily did, being the um, foremost statistician in, in the country. And um, we started these workshops in 2013. Prior to that, I'd actually made contact with um, Sakamozi when he was working in Richards Bay. And I'd said to him the one day, how come there is no Zulu word for a Natal Robin? In those days, it was, it was called a Natal Robin, a red capped Robin chat now. And I said to him, it's unusual that a bird that is so common in Natal doesn't even have a Zulu name. It, it was known as Ukaga. The Cape Robin is also known as Ukaga. And it, to me, it was amazing that two such different looking birds could carry the same name. And he said to me on that day, and it was a long, long time ago, and I'll never forget it. He said to me, I also think it's strange. A bird like that should have its own individual name. And if I was to give it a name, I would call it Ink on Steel. And that was what flared my interest in this project because Ingonstini is a concertina, as, as um, you may hear from the, 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 the Zulu, kind of Zulu version. And there is no better way of describing the Natal Robin than calling it a concertina for the amount of sounds that it can produce. So basically, that is how the idea of this book originated back from then. And maybe it was actually the Natal Robin that generated the idea of doing these projects. Fantastic. And, and Saki, I can see you smiling there as Nolene's telling the story. I'm sure that memory holds with you too. <laughs> Fantastic. Then Nolene, you obviously had this, uh, a few sort of iterations of these manuscripts. How did you go about finding a publisher in Jakarta Media and Roberts to, to really bring this book as it is today and we're launching? When we had got stuck into these uh, workshops and we realized that we needed um, an ornithologist and a scientist to join us, we invited Roger Porter, who was extremely excited about the idea that there should be customs and culture backing the names of these birds. And once we had got seven eighths of the way through this manuscript, he suggested that we show the manuscript to Hugh Chittenden, who was the chairman of the John Falker Bird Book Fund. Um, he was, uh, immediately interested when he saw the manuscript, which we are most grateful for, um, because it was Hugh that has so graciously contributed all the beautiful pictures that you find in this book, together with other um, photographers who so uh, selflessly just donated their pictures uh, and we haven't had to pay for them. Otherwise, we could never have afforded to produce a quality book of this nature. So once um, the John Falker Bird Book Foundation came on board. Um, we contacted Hugh um, and uh, through um, Roger, we sourced other photographs through Ingrid, his wife, who's also the renowned artist of the Roberts Bird Book. And um, the rest, as we say, is history. They've managed to put together this marvelous book, um, which Guy Upfolds so skillfully crafted together as the, um, the guy who did the design of the book. Absolutely. And uh, I think something that really stood out for me in this book when I was fortunate enough to receive my advanced copy was that what you've done at the beginning is really document how you went about creating this book with this whole workshop process. And I remember you saying to me when we were having our initial meetings that what this has really done is laid down a foundation for other indigenous knowledge um, systems to come at come into um, the ornithological world and start laying down a foundation for other languages to create similar products for the different language groups we have in, here in Africa. Would you like to just elaborate a little bit more on how the sort of workshop process went down in the development of this book, please? Sure. Well, 
we really hope that this will be a blueprint for all other indigenous languages, not only in Africa, but actually internationally. Because the way linguistically this book has been laid out is so that any other person or any other language who wants to develop their vernacular for, uh, for their regional birds, that all they really need to do is follow this particular blueprint. And when we did this, these workshops, we wanted to find out and identify and record existing vernacular names for all the birds found in our um, KwaZulu Natal region. We wanted to select one commonly used name for each species. So where you had Ukwazi being the one word that you had for a number of different eagles, we wanted to de develop it so you get Ukwazi Olumnyama for the Vero's eagle and Ukwazi uh, Olumidwa for the African hawk eagle. You, we wanted to distinct what made them different from just being all cozy? They are eagles, but they are different kinds of eagles. We wanted to um, reassign names where necessary. For example, um, for the um, brown hooded kingfisher, uh, we made the, the genus name Indoazela for looking motionless at something when they're waiting for prey to come along. And then we reassigned the name for the brown-hooded kingfisher, and we called it Ispigelele, which Ispigelele means to be persistent. And if you know the brown-hooded kingfisher's call, it has a very persistent kind of call. And the last part of the, the workshop was coining and creating new names where none had existed before. And I'm going to leave it to uh, the guides to elaborate on that process because that was the most creative process of all. And if you know anything about Zulu culture and Zulu heritage, um, Zulu people are basically poets. They have lived orally and spoken orally and recorded message, messages orally um, for hundreds of years and writing only came into existence for them in 1905. So everything that they had to um, record was buried in their memory. So they have a very creative way of recalling things. They have to rely on poetic techniques. And when you hear the names of these birds, they really are poetic. And they have so many aspects to them and metaphorical links to them. And I'm going to ask the guides as they go through, we've got a couple of pages where we can pick up specific birds and show you how the naming process went. But it basically was um, putting people around a table, groups, uh, three groups or five or six guides at a time and showing up the pictures from the Roberts Multimedia, discussing the breeding habits, discussing the appearance, discussing the call, discussing the behavior of the birds, and then deciding which particular aspect we wanted to focus on. So that, and once we had dis, uh, common, um, everybody commonly agreed with the process and the name that we'd chosen, we would record it and move on to the next bird. So, that, I think, is as much time as I'm going to take up of yours. And I think if you want to pass the questions over to the guides now, they can um, explain a little bit more about the process. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think we're going to kick off firstly with um, Timber. And thank you very much, uh, Nolene, just for laying down the, the background on how that um, book really came about. And uh, Timber, this one's for you. And I'd like you to just elaborate a little bit on how you see this bird field guide assisting you in your work. We know you're very involved in a lot of education initiatives and training initiatives. How are you gonna use this book going forward? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, indeed. I can just say it without hesitation that the book has been vitally important and I can foresee the success of the book already uh, from my environmental education program that I'm already running with the schools. Yeah, I can already see this as taking an incredible positive effect. Um, already the people I'm from, my bird club in St. Lucia, a lot of the people, they're already interested to buy some of the books. So already I have already ordered a few copies that I hope to bring back home with. So I think the book is so unique in the fact that it will obviously help our time on a custom, um, you know, to avoid the danger of disappearing because it's so descriptive. Uh, when I started to work on the project, this is what I like. I might have seen so many books written and I mean, trying to explain the Zulu bits in English and English and Zulu. 
But to see this one, as Prof Nolin has said, is quite very, very descriptive. And uh, this is what you want back into the language. It's seriously helping to, to boost the language and also help it from disappearing. So my little ones, um, that's the only way and that because you better start up from early years of life, of course, if you want to ensure that people get to contribute into any environmental conservation. So I feel like it's going to help them when they could be able to get the names, which is more descriptive into what they can easily follow. Uh, the fact that it is written in Zulu, I, I feel like it's, it's very uh, descriptive and it will be positive for them. Absolutely, and I'd like you to, to elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, if we have a look at how the book, you mentioned that it's, it's really enriching that Zulu language, and um, we've obviously brought in a lot of Zulu cultural heritage into some of these names, and through that workshop process, um, all of you have had input in trying to link a lot of the Zulu culture with how these different bird names have been developed, and I love the, the name of the African foot, uh, fin foot, which is um, directly translated to one who paddles water, Igwed Lamanzi. Yeah. So yeah. that's an, an example. Are there any other ones that you'd like to uh, to talk a little bit more about? Um, well, there's quite there's quite a few indeed, and uh, uh, there's quite a few indeed. Uh, if you can just look at Ontoia, um, uh, Ontoia, uh, it's a yellow bull kite, right? So the, the local people, like, you know, when the kid um, is about to, he obviously lose, you know, he's about to, to grow up in your tooth and he then loses the, the older one, yeah, the older tooth. And then the new one obviously will have to grow. And you see, parents have got to sing that uh, and, and give me the new one, which means that and uh, oh, yellow yellow card, yellow bull card, take this old teeth of tooth of mine and try to replace it with a new one. And this only happens at a time when Enchoye reaches us in South Africa, which is probably around August. Right. But also uh, more interesting about Enchoye is that um, we, we have also to look at the kind of lily which is called uh, Scadoxis. Um, by that time, the name of employer is just very linked to that, which is probably the same time the, the lily just comes out in August. Um, I we're struggling with a little bit of few names, as Noreen suggested, we, we're hoping to coin up some of the names based on the behavior. And um, if you look at uh, the birds like Intolbanji, um, uh, which is a squad coherent. It's just only orally named. Uh, we haven't just got the right name for that. And we feel like we should have the right names for those bits. And the other very nice name, um, I'm not going to say them all, but specifically those that we always touch you. You just look at a long tail with a bit, right? Just got a very, very uh, long tail. And in Zulu, it just says, there's a, um, there's a proverb which says, Ucho, ucho, umingo, ti, luake, which means that, um, a man is just sticking on his own belief. And that's, that's quite very descriptive of, of the structure of the base, the way how it looks like with its long dangling tail at the time. Thank you. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks so much, Tim, and I agree with you. That's such a great way of describing those very confident male widow birds that go floating across the grasslands. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. Now, the next one, Sakamuzi, is for you. And uh, we want to know how important do you think it was to include some of the Zulu beliefs and bird lore in the text on these KZN bird species? And I always remember as an undergrad at university, I was taught the name of the green wood hoopoo, the, the laughing yeah. woman. And that is such a beautiful way of describing that bird because its call is exactly that, the laughter of women. So do you want to just tell us a little bit more about those Zulu beliefs and bird lore in some of the names, please? Yeah, uh, thanks very much, yeah. Um, yes, I think uh, it was very, very important to use all those uh, beliefs because one of the biggest problems that we have in this country, we're losing indigenous knowledge. We're slowly, slowly uh, uh, losing the indigenous uh, language. So this book is an answer to that because um, there's a lot of, um, lot of sayings that are in this book that were used by, uh, by our forefathers when they communicate. There are quite a few of them and then it takes us back uh, to the time 
of, um, of our forefathers, they communicate, quite a few of them. Um, you know what, um, they can sit in a group like this, in a group of four or five people, but I can still communicate with the junior. I can still go see um, people who are, are in the same room with me because they, they knew very well about all those things and need and belief. Um, to, to, to mention uh, some, some of them, somebody said this part of work has folded. It means that the danger is imminent. I can say, Junior, let's go home now. This part of work has folded. And if somebody do, uh, doesn't understand what we mean, what we mean, and then it's, it's also another way of sending a message. And, uh, it's only those people that will understand it. There are quite a few that we use by, uh, by our, our product forefathers. And then those uh, sayings are sort of, most of them, they are not in, in black and white. And then this book is an answer to that because they, 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 they are sort of writing. Uh, our, uh, our generation means we will learn about them. We will never forget about all of those, uh, all of those things. And then if somebody say, go away, my dad, they will pull out the feathers. And then uh, if, you, if you know that if you're doing something wrong and your parents say that, and you'll never do it again. And then those kinds of things, um, um, uh, it's so important that we, we, we keep them. It's so important that our, our generation know about those, the, the, those things. Uh, this, this book is, is very, very unique because it doesn't only talk about the names of the there's some stories, uh, there's some beliefs that are, that are written uh, in this book. There are quite a few, some other beliefs that we have. Uh, some of people, they know that uh, we also believe that. Some that uh, the hour brings some dead spirit. That does not mean that we must kill the hours. It's on the special people who are allowed to chase away uh, the bad spirit by not touching the art, not killing the art. Those are the things that uh, uh, this book also remind how the forefathers used to do things in the, in the, in the, in the, in the right way, in the correct way. Uh, they, yeah, it, it was very, very important that all those things, because slowly, slowly things are changing, people are forgetting things. And then it also remind us uh, that even our forefathers, they also uh, look at the bad's behavior very, very close. It's, it doesn't start with Temba or Juna or myself to look at, at bits. Uh, because of these things are very, very old. It shows that it has given us a confidence. Even our fathers, they were, they were also into conservation. They also uh, rely on these bits when they come back from migration. And then uh, it, it bears like red-chested cuckoo, which we call it Pezomko. If you turn the clock back, there was nothing. There was no calendar. There was no TV that remind people what times of the year it is. And then they rely on those bits when they migrate back and then they start planting their, their crops. And then that also shows that even our forefathers, they were also very careful. They were also um, look at the migration of, of, of birds. And then people these days, they forget it. They forget it. How do they, how, how does people know it's, it's springs? Uh, how do people know that it's summer? It's because of the of these bits, and then there's a lot of these uh, these things that are in these books that also remind us uh, that um, that how our forefathers uh, used to live in older days. That's that how our forefathers used to communicate in the older days. And then I'll say this is one of the unique bed book that not only talk about the names but also talk about the stories. That's also remind us uh, about where we came from, yeah. That's amazing, Saki, and I think it's such a beautiful thing that we can combine the, the conservation of birds with the conservation of indigenous knowledge systems in such a, a wonderful publication. So thank you so much for sharing those um, anecdotes with us. And I think a bird that is probably very well known for its cultural importance is our 2020 Bird of the Year which is in Singizi or the Southern Ground Hornball. Now, I noticed when I was reading through the book that there's a couple of birds that have more than one name. Saki, do you want to just tell us why there's a few birds where there are in, in sort of cases where some of these birds have multiple names and not just one? Uh, it depends. It depends. Like, um, 
if you look at Zululand, it's, it's, it's very, very big, and then it depends on the regions. And, and each and every tribe or region or each and every village, they have their own, own name. It depends because um, they, they look at the behavior, they look at the, uh, uh, the way these bits uh, uh, act, and then they just come up with, 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 with different names. Yeah, that's, that's how it works. It depends on the village, and then it also depends um, on the village and the people, and then they come up with, uh, with, 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 with such names. Fantastic. So it would be quite right to say in Singizi or in Gududu, and people would know which bird you're talking about as long as you're in the exactly. right region. <laughs> exactly. It depends on which, which part of Zulian where you came from, because sometimes the uh, first part of Zulian, they have different names, and then the south of Zulian, Zulian yeah, they also have a different name, but it's one of the same bits. Fantastic. And I think it's great that you've been able to catch capture that sort of regional variation. Now, yeah. Junior, this next one's coming to you. We know that COVID-19 has had a huge impact on our tourism industry. But um, how do you think that tourists, both local and international, um, are going to find this book? And do you think they're going to have interest in learning these Zulu bird names and their meanings? Thank you so much, Melissa. Yes, um, indeed. Um, if you look at this book, uh, how is, it's been uh, written, uh, it's got a lot of information that everyone wants to know about. Uh, the facts and uh, the folklore are there about the names of these beds. And also it symbolizes, that it's very symbolic in terms of um, uh, some of the bed species which are on that book. It tells you exactly like Saki has been explaining about um, the registered cuckoo, of which impressively as we speak now, um, people when they hear that bed, they still know that what is it about, what's happening about the seasons. So taking this information back to, uh, to our people, to our generation, to our children, it's quite, it's quite useful, it's quite useful. Even the people from overseas, remember when they come to South Africa, when they come to Africa, they wanna learn about our, our cultures, they wanna learn about our customs, they wanna learn about uh, our uh, historically uh, heritage. So those things are quite vital for them to learn about. So this book for them, and also um, for us as well, because it seems as if uh, most of our children, when they move to the cities, uh, it seems as if they've lost quite a bit of information about um, our Zulu names of, 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 of babes. So um, having this information uh, and take this information back to our families and also to the people who are visiting uh, our continent is going to be useful. It's, it's like we are marketing our, our continent and also it gives some sort of an identity as a Zulu nation. And also we need to know that um, we are the nation that has got so proud about uh, the culture and the beliefs and everything. So uh, having that information a little bit of, uh, away from us, it's gonna be a problem uh, for the future generation. So that is why it's, uh, I think with this book now we have in, it, it's very, very important. It's gonna be quite useful for us and also to transfer that information uh, to pass on that information to the people of the world who tend to visit our country. So I think uh, looking at this uh, information now that we have, we can be able to use, we can be able to conquer, we can be able, we'll be able to, um, to revive our culture and also our beliefs when it comes to, uh, to the nations. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Junior. And I think it's so important in conservation to give something a name and its own name. And so I think this book has done such a good job of doing that. Now, I see there was a question from Katie Border in the, in the chat box, just talking to the next question. So I hope Katie that this will uh, um, answer your question. But we know that this publication is largely um, based in English and obviously it does then translate all of the Zulu names into English. Junior, do you think that there's a need to take this book and actually translate the entire thing into Isi Zulu? Yes, as I said earlier on, it, um, uh, you know, uh, there is a lot of um, things that have contributed to that, uh, losing that kind of information because um, we talk about things like a social economic impact has played a huge influence because when people tend to move to the cities, they expose themselves to the different lifestyle and then they tend to meet up with different people at the same time, they lose a little bit of a culture. So having this book uh, translated in Zulu 
and taking that information back to our generations, back to our families, it would help a lot in terms of uh, getting that knowledge uh, viable to our families and instilling that culture which has been uh, lost for years. So I think this book now, um, uh, getting more people like Zulu, Zulu people, would be, a, a, a very, would be worthwhile for them to get that information in order to, to keep that culture going in our children and in our generations as well. Absolutely. And it's such a danger with our global society. We're all sort of converging into one beast. It's great that we can capture those unique Zulu aspects in this book. And yeah, I hope can that I, it will. Yes, Nolene, go for it. Can I come in there just for a minute? Just to say that um, with a heads up to the, the book being translated into Zulu, I've actually been working on that and it's just about completed. Brilliant. So I've been working with a translator to translate the book entirely. Into Zulu. And the next step, obviously, is to find a publisher because I think this really needs to go into the schools and into the vernacular so children at a young age can learn the names of the birds in their own vernacular languages before they learn it in a foreign language. That would have great impact, I think. Absolutely, and that's wonderful to hear that you are ahead of the game there, Nolene. Brilliant. And we look forward to that completely Isizulu publication coming out in the future. Now, following on from what we've just been talking about, Junior, um, Saki, I'd like you just to elaborate on some of the examples where we're seeing a lot of um, the, the older used bird names sort of slipping off the radar a little bit. And I know this book has worked very hard to try and capture some of those old names and make sure that we don't lose them from um, our sort of historical precedent. So um, are there a few examples where um, some of the names might have fallen out of use, but um, we've been, been sure to capture them in this book? Yes, Saki, would you like to just uh, elaborate on that a bit, please? Do you try to come to Saki, can you hear me? Oh, yes, 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 yes. I can hear you now. Uh, yeah, okay. there are quite a few uh, old names that were uh, <laughs> that were used in the older days, and then we we sort of feel that um, we need because this book is also uh, the main aim is to sort of educate and then come up with the names that were also could be also acceptable to to to, to the general. Um, um, yeah. There were quite a few of them, quite a few of them that, that we didn't include while we were. Uh, names like Intuni Yamazi, <laughs> uh, we didn't put them on this book. Uh, yeah, because if, <laughs> yeah, because of the meaning. The meaning is too sort of um, uh, embarrassing. Okay. Uh, we, try, we try to find another, another, another way of, of, we look at the behavior, we look at the the habit, and then we come up with the with with with, with the new. You know? yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I don't know, Junior, yeah. Timber, would any of you like to uh, add to that? <laughs> Sorry, Nolene, yeah. you guys are on mute there. Sorry. I just wanted to come in to help. Um, uh, I can see Sakapos is very embarrassed about that uh, saying <laughs> those words. Amongst, amongst the Zulus, it's very very difficult to say anything that's uh, that's connected with genitals. It's just not polite behavior. Mm -hmm. And so what he was the example of there was um, the Malachite kingfisher used to be known as Inshunyamanzi, which means the <laughs> vagina of the water because it used to fly, fly so low to the water, it used to drag its lower parts into just yeah. about into the water. It was so close to the water. And we, we found, we all decided at these workshops that it was just, um, some people found it quite vulgar, so they've asked for it to have a a, a, a more sort of um, acceptable name, and that's why we uh, the, the name has now changed uh, to, to to something else yeah. to save people having to say the words that are not acceptable. Okay. But also to but also to add to that, uh, there's uh, some of you guys who remember this Coco Heron, right? Uh, we had to find a name like Idol Panchi for the Coco Heron. But now we looked at that and it was not very descriptive because the other skillful thing we've been trying to do here, which was never tried before, was to try and coin these birds' names from generic to species. So now they can what you can just call as the same name and as well as their species. So we had to say, okay, 
Chope means what? Matuta, then it's just a generic. And then, yeah. Yeah, Matuta is a nice name, meaning uh, you see the way how they sit. I mean, it's most of the characteristic herons hunting method. They just sit like quietly still, making sure that they would be able, um, I mean, they should not be easily be detected or identified the, the, by their prey. So the fish and frogs can just swim close by them. And like at Tony Lens, they have those interaction to catch anything like frog and fish close to their Feet. So this is one of their skillful, and most of those herons family, they've got to be given like matuta, which is a characteristic uh, method of hunting where they can just sit like very still and quiet. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Timber, and thanks, Saki, for your, your earlier answer as well. So yeah. the next one, uh, Junior, is for you. And we were obviously talking about a lot of these um, younger Zulus moving into more urban areas and starting to lose cont contact with a lot of those um, Zulu names of the birds in particular. So I've put on three on the screen here. And would you like to just tell us a little bit about um, your experience with how well known are the bird names among general Zulus? Are they aware of their birds? I know when I when I sort of move around Johannesburg and I run into people, they'll know a dove or a pigeon or um, maybe even a heron. But if I talk about a purple heron or a squacko heron, they're not going to know necessarily what I'm talking about. Have you had a similar experience moving through the Zulu um, Zulu regions as well? Uh, yes. Um, what I would say, if I can uh, tell you a little bit of uh, background uh, in like environmental education, um, I started since. Um, 2005 to uh, educate uh, children about the environment. Uh, I've joined quite a few organizations. I've worked for um, Wildlife Society. And then uh, fortunately, I met uh, Nicolette and uh, the Professor uh, Forbes in 2013. And um, I've been able to engage with different uh, um, um, grades uh, in all, in all the provinces because we used to get uh, students from uh, coming from all over the country. So what happened, uh, uh, but uh, if I can, uh, particularly the Zulus uh, who are coming from the province. So I've got a very, uh, some people who would ask, like the children would ask about the Zulu names uh, of the birds. But what, I, what is intriguing is that once you start speaking about, uh, talking about the, bringing those Zulu names of, 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 of birds, then children, they start to ask questions. So it shows that they have this interest about the Zulu names, but even though that they've lost quite a bit of them, but once you start speaking about the, the you talk about the Zulu names of birds, then they start to remember. So like, for instance, the words like Inlanzi, uh, the, the Inlanzi has always been known, well, very well known in, in Zulu land as, as a, like the speckled, a speckled mouse bird. So, Children, even today, they still know. If you ask about them about Indians, then they will tell you exactly which bird is that. So I think, even though we've lost a little bit of uh, the Zulu names, but there are children who leave their old or uh, the older ones at home. They still have that little bit of information, of which is still existing, still in use in those families, of which I found it so intriguing as as well. Absolutely, that is fascinating. And uh, Timba, I know you've been working a lot with um, environmental education in engaging with the learners and talking to them a little, about, a little bit about this book. Have you been receiving quite a positive response from them? Do they want to get access to the book and use it um, in your different classes and interactions? Absolutely, um, absolutely, Melissa. Kids seem to be more interested in these conservation uh, tours that we do. And of course, uh, without knowledge, um, we do not have future. So remember that our children, they are future generations. And the only way how we can successfully navigate through conservation is to try and engage them, to try and make them feel like being part and parcel of conservation. And the only way one could achieve that is to try and make them be part of these uh, educa environmental education that most of guys are doing. Yeah, maybe in future, we will just make sure that we have got much more healthy-minded generation when it comes to conservation. So the response, in shortly, is quite amazingly high. I can say that uh, kids and teachers, they're very positive to participate. 
And obviously with new books like this, which uh, describe most of the zoo knowledge of birds and animals into their language, that should be very, very interesting for them. Absolutely, and I think it's such a privilege to be able to influence young minds. And I think the work that all of you do with young um, children in South Africa is just wonderful. And you never know when you're gonna spark that future conservationist in a young person. So a huge congratulations to all of you for the work that you do with our youth and please keep it up. And I'm glad that this book is gonna be a wonderful addition to what you guys are teaching them. Now, we said we were gonna have a look at some of the, the books. So this page, I think I'm gonna ask Saki to have a look at, it's our gannets, cormorants and darters. Saki, do you wanna pick one of the species on these pages and just talk a little bit about the development of the name of one of these birds and what the name is and how you guys got to it, please? Yeah, um, it wasn't easy. It was a difficult task for us to come up with the names because normally we only have the family names. Uh, so we have to sit down and discuss and look at the behavior, look at the uh, how the bird, look at the colors, look at how it hunts, look at all those smaller things, and then eventually we sort of uh, come up with with, with the names, uh, with the names. Now if you look at this one, uh, quite a few uh, birds in there, and then look at, if you look at one there to on on the left, the shapes you might think that it's a snake that is eating the fish, and then that's what also we sit down as a group and then we said ah, this one we're gonna call it uh, <coughs> and then the, yeah and then this is an african data if you look at the shape it's got a long neck uh, the way it's hunt the way it swim you might even confuse it with the snakes and then that's what, that's what we as a group uh, decided um, yeah, that's how we, we, we come up with some few names. It, there was a lot of uh, argument, there was a lot of <laughs> uh, talk about the groups. Um, sometimes it took, it took about an hour to come up with the name, but eventually we, we all agreed on, on different names. But what helped us, it's, a, it's the way uh, birds behave, it's, it's the shape of the birds, it's the colors of the bird. Um, it's how, it, it, it's a shape. It's, it's just uh, things that we, we always consider when we identify the birds and then eventually we come up with, with these different names. Yeah, in, yes. and in addition to that, uh, if you look at, um, obviously, when you watch these birds, uh, the darts, when you see them sticking out their head, mm -hmm. the shape is where it, tells, it looks exactly like a snake. So that combination of two things, a snake and a bird, which is um, very striking. Uh, when you see these birds, obviously you see that it's the same. But uh, another one there on top will be the, uh, the Cape Gannet. Uh, we, the naming is based on how uh, these birds hunt. Obviously these are oceanic birds and uh, they don't come offshore. Um, but uh, when you look at them far, like far in distance, miles, miles away, the way they hunt, the way they that arrow shape, when they go down diving into the water during hunting time, it tells exactly about it's Uber months. That's how it, it dives down into the water. It's exactly, it's very well translated. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for that, Jeannie. I think it's it's a brilliant name and I, I love how descriptive these names are. I think I'm gonna have to switch over to some of these Zulu names. They're far more descriptive than the English ones. Thanks for sharing those two with us. <laughs> okay, another another group of birds is sticking with the water birds here. But uh, Junior, do you wanna also just elaborate on um, some of the turns and the skewer, please? Is there anyone that stands out for you? Yes, awesome. Uh, if you look at the top one, the Arctic turn, and then we also we also basically we, we sit down and talk and discuss, and then eventually uh, we uh, we agreed on the name in Sugagud. The names came from the distance uh, where the, the distance where uh, these birds fly, and um, and also the, there's quite a few things uh, this bird can eat while it's flying can also fly why it's also sleeping. There are quite a few things that we, 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 we sit down and discuss about, about this bit. And then we come up with the name called Insua, which, which, which means that uh, this, this bit comes from far away. 
Fantastic. Timbo, do you want to talk to any of the, the other birds on that page there, please? Um, yeah, I'm trying to check. Um, yeah, you can see it. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, I got uh, MPC Yolwantle. Remember, MPC, they scavengers, right? Yeah, so they like hyenas. They will just, uh, you know, they take the, the, the leftover from other animals. So we came about, we had to look around some of the birds, their skillful behavior of hunting and how they just do it in the wild naturally. And then we have to come up with these names. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. And then I know the, the area that you guide in the most is famous for its twin spots. Would you like Absolutely. to tell us a little bit about those twin spots, please, Tim? Absolutely, yeah. Um, let me talk a little bit about the one on the bottom left, um, the pink trotted twin spot. It's such a beautiful male twin spot there. Nice picture. Uh, the Latin name is um, Hypergos margaritatus. It's for those who might have taken interest in the Latin name, you will remember it all from the Greek myth about uh, the multi-eyed serpent. So if you check the bottom of the bird, it is decorated with hundred eyes, beautiful eyes underneath. Now, the Zulu names for it is called Uma Kumejana. Okay, uh, my mom is also Uma Kumej, is from the Kumeja tribes anyway. So that's why I should know this one better. But um, Uma Kumechana means uh, the Gumeda little girl, beautiful little girl as this twin spot is. Uh, she used to be quite crafty with her beard. So yeah, so that's how the bird got his name about Uma Kumechana. Mm -hmm. Because she used to wear beautiful beards, of course. That's how she got that name from. So this is one of the birds as you said, in the dry sand forest where I live around Timber Elephant Park. So I have got a lot of kids to be exposed to it, a lot of homesteads to be exposed to the birds like this. And the only way one has to do that, I had to ask those local homesteads to plant beautiful trees in their garden, not like serious big trees, but your stripes like your Cape Honeycycle or Tecomora Capensis, that's how they call them. Those they beautiful as stripes with beautiful orange bell shaped flowers. They will collect nettles and juice and these birds are like sunbirds and many others, they will love them. So I have, I have to encourage these locals to try and start, you know, attracting these birds into their gardens. Because remember with the local people, you always have to paint the value of uh, tourism, of conservation. Why do you want them not to shoot the birds? Like I grew up shooting birds. Um, you have to find some ways to make it sustainable. So my bidding for sustainable living program and uh, Temple Elephant Park is more about people attracting birds into their garden by planting very, very uh, bird, uh, bird, uh, bird attractive stuff within their garden. So they will be able to attract the visitors and they're visiting the nearby reserves. They, they can just come and pay them the visit and do a bit of bedding. And this way, those local communities they start generating a bit of income because it's quite very unfair. I mean, you've got all those people never in the parks and they, they cannot appreciate conservation if not being made to be part of conservation. So you see those are another ways how I'm trying hard to, to be a mediator, trying hard to play my part. You say to people, yeah, but you can't just look at birds as birds. They have got more value onto them. And I, I am, of course, a living example of these, uh, including all those guys um, out there. So the, the people slowly, they are more likely to believe your story, at least if you have got something to work out and support it with. Yeah, but this program, they seriously need a lot of support if it is possible. Yeah, because I'm just doing it on my own. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Tim. And I think it's such an important point that you make. Everyone in their own right can do something for conservation, as simple as planting good indigenous flora in your garden and attracting more birds. That can make such a huge difference to our birds. So thank you for, for sharing that work and sharing the name of that amazing bird. Now, um, we've just gone eight o'clock, so I'm conscious of the time. But um, Nalene, can you just elaborate a little bit on where people can get their hands on this amazing book? I see quite a few people are, are um, asking where they can get their copies from, please. Sure. Um I've just been uh, made aware by Jakarta that they are actually um, distributing the book through Loot. Um, so you can go online and order the book through Loot. I've, um, 
I have the link, um, which I can yeah. send to you um, if you want to put it out for people. But um, the, the price of the book is really reasonable. They've given quite a considerable discount through Loot. So that's where you can order the book and then it gets to your home. Um, I, I myself uh, have a number of books that Jakana had sent me, so I'm able to distribute them in my area. But for people outside the area, they, they perhaps will want to look at buying it online. Fantastic. Or directly yeah. from Jakana, yeah. Yeah, everyone who um, is signed into the webinar this evening, when you exit the webinar, you will be directed to that loot link. So um, as you exit, your internet browser should take you straight to the order form for the book if you would like to get a copy of your own. Now, we have been very kindly donated a single copy for um, a lucky listener this evening. And our prize winner this evening is going to be Sianda Sibia. So congratulations, Sianda, and thank you for tuning in. Um, I'll be in touch with you after the webinar just to arrange and delivery of that prize to you. So thank you so much for tuning in and uh, really great that we can get a copy of that to you. Now, I see we do have a couple of questions and I am aware of time. So I think we're gonna cut it to about 10 minutes for questions so that we don't take up everyone's evenings. But um, in the question and answer box, um, I see we've got a question from Eleanor Mary Cattle saying, the names you give information about the bird's behavior in poetic fashion, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, does the text explain the meaning of the Zulu names in English? So can you just elaborate a little bit more, Nolene, um, of how the actual structure of the different bird pages are um, worked up? I, I'll pull up a, a copy of one of those pages again, just to um, show everyone while you're answering, please. Yes, in fact, every page has, um, well, not every um, section of birds has a generic name, but most, we tried we could to put the generic name for the group of birds, and then Added on that, so each bird has a species specific name, and the, the species specific name is given the Zulu derivation. So, for example, Ndwazela would be given to the kingfishers, uh, and that would be because Ndwazela uh, is the, the way of sitting and looking, staring straight ahead. Uh, and then we give um, individual names, species specific names, for example. Uzango Zolo or Pigaleli, where it comes from the bird's call. So uh, Pigaleli to be persistent. So every single name is given those the derivation and the meaning. Fantastic. Thanks, Naomi. And I see we've also got distribution maps there as well, which will be nice for everyone to see. Um, we've also got a, a question from Penny Abbott. Now, I know the, that some of the guys um, mentioned the belief in owls. And she says, this is so interesting. It would seem that the traditional law is lost in the cities. How do we sort out the spread of knowledge so that um, we can improve these environmental education programs in our cities as well to try and help bring that knowledge to um, the urban dwellers? And Junia, I don't know if you want to speak to this a little bit more as to how we get our urban um, dwellers to really buy into this conservation initiative, please. Um, I think uh, the only way uh, to get this message across uh, is to do more of uh, environmental education in the urban areas, uh, engaging with uh, uh, the children out there. But uh, the only challenge would be how are we going to have an access to those schools? Because you find out that uh, in most cases, when you get out, when you want to um, um, have a, like sort of an excursion uh, with children, uh, most of the schools, they can't actually afford uh, to get out and, and, and also to, to learn um, about, 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 uh, the, 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 about, about our beds. So one of the problems is that um, is people, the children, they, don't, they can't afford, some of the schools, uh, they can't afford actually a, a sponsor or to, 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 to support their children uh, in, in order to get out to, to learn about uh, the, the environment. So it's one of the problems now. The big challenge would be uh, how do we um, and, and access those schools and how do we uh, go around and get the funding for them so that they can be able to access that information. Mm -hmm. So for us, we, we are available anytime to go and help wherever we need it. But the, the, the challenge would be uh, the, like the traveling for the children, they need to get out. So you can't, some of the work, you can't actually go and do the indoors. You have to get out with the children so that they can be able to get information outside. So that's going to be the challenge, but we are available anytime to assist.
but uh, we are still looking at the ways how we're going to, um, uh, to go through with this. But I also think time being, um, if, if these books, because this is a book that uh, uh, learners, uh, especially the Zulus people, people, they can read and, and understand it very well. It can be, if it can be available in, in their school, uh, so that learners, they can also learn and learn about uh, these, these things that we are talking about. I think um, for so many years, the, uh, the black people, they were sort of not that much involved in conserving birds and their habitat, not that because they didn't want it, but because there's not a lot of information that is written in their language that they can understand. Now that we have these books, if we can maybe find somebody who, uh, who is willing to do the sponsor some certain school and buy these schools and be available in this, uh, uh, um, in, in, in these township schools uh, or in these local schools, yeah. Thanks, Aki, and I think that, that's such an important point and uh, maybe a good call to action for any of our listeners who would be willing to maybe sponsor a book to a few of the schools. Um, it would Melissa, be wonderful to see this distributed broadly. Nolene, yes. Melissa, can I just make a quick point about that, uh, that particular point? Uma Jetjana is the African Scops are. It, was, it had two names, Uma Jetjana and Umloi. Now, one of the things that we try to do in this, in this um, workshop process is to discourage the use of names that have negative connotations for birds, because that's one of the problems. Umloi uh, refers to somebody, a witch or a sorcerer, and this name was formerly given to the African Scots Owl. And we try to encourage the name of Umajlet Aina, which means small little ears. It has a much more positive um, connotation to it, and we want to get rid of the negative connotations which carry um, vision of ours being uh, uh, witches, familiars, and that type of thing, and reverse that kind of folklore uh, with positivity. So those kind of projects we are also um, working with our bird guides on in their education programs. Absolutely, that's wonderful, Nolene. And I see some people are quite keen to sponsor. I think if anyone is interested in helping sponsor a few copies, you're welcome to, Nolene, can I give them your email just to, sure. to contact. No, no um, problem. So that'll be um, turnerin at ukzn.ac.za if you'd like to get in touch and, and look at sponsoring those copies. I see we're, we're almost out of time, but uh, really just from my side, um, thank you to Jakana Media, to the uh, John Fulker Bird Book Fund, as well as BirdLife South Africa for making tonight's event possible. I've really, really enjoyed engaging with all of you. Timbo, you hiding off of screen there, but lovely <laughs> to have all of you together. Oh, Nolene and Tembo can just squeeze in there together. Um, thank you so much, Nolene, Tembo, Sakamuzi, Junior, Ngia Bonga. It's been an absolute pleasure hosting this event with all of you. And uh, I hope that everybody has a great evening further. And if there are any more questions, you're welcome to drop us an email at conversations at birdlife.org.za and we'll pass those on to our, our authors tonight. Thank you all so much for joining us. Good night to everyone. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Cheers. Thank you so much. See you Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Nikki. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.